So yeah, so today I'm going to, or this evening, I'm going to introduce us to this character of Akashobia, who um, you'll see up in the shrine room here, this beautiful shrine, absolutely amazing shrine made by Jayadi and Rachel, really, really beautiful. And um, Akashobia is this deep blue figure uh, at the front here. And um, yeah, what I'll say is, first of all, a little bit about the whole mandala of these Buddhas, because we're going to hear from Akashobi and then four more um, of these Buddha figures over the next few days. So I'll say uh, something about all of them um, as a group, and then I'll talk a bit more about um, Akashobia. So, so Akashobia is, he sits in the east of the five Buddha mandala. And the five Buddha mandala is basically, it's a tantric symbol. It comes from Mahayana Buddhism, from tantric uh, Buddhism. And the mandala of Buddhas that we're going to meet over the next five days uh, basically are, um, you could say, sort of symbols of various aspects of enlightenment. So enlightenment isn't just this sort of one quality or this one characteristic it's actually numerous qualities numerous characteristics in fact it's all the human qualities completely perfected uh, completely purified of all negativity and completely radiant and positive all of those qualities perfected by the buddha uh, with his enlightenment and there have been various figures um, various buddhas that have made themselves present to buddhist meditators down through the years um, uh, within their meditation or within their um, reflection as symbolizing particularly strong aspects of a certain, uh, well, a certain aspect of enlightenment. So uh, it might be a wisdom aspect, it might be the compassion aspect, it might be the fearlessness aspect. We'll meet those figures as we go through in the next, over the next five days. Um, but these, these figures, I think, Firstly, really what I want to say about the mandala of these Buddhist figures is they, they're not symbols as we usually think of symbols. Or you could say they're, they're not just symbols. They're not just symbols in the sense of, um, well, we think of a symbol often as something that we've put the meaning onto or we've put the force onto through our own sort of subjective um, agency. There is an aspect of that with these Buddha figures, but also these Buddha figures are very, very live and creative agents in the world. And uh, they've made themselves aware to various Buddhist meditators down through the years. And I think if we open ourselves up to their influence, if we open ourselves up to Akashobi's influence and all the other Buddha's influences, they too are looking to communicate with us. Uh, they're also looking to broadcast to us. And actually what we can do is we can just open up to that broadcast as much as possible and uh, they too will be able to reach us. So they are always looking to communicate. Uh, you could say the transcendent or uh, uh, the divine is always looking to communicate and can we open up to them? So everything in, um, uh, uh, in Tantric Buddhism, where these, um, uh, uh, these, uh, 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 these figures come from, uh, this mandala comes from, um, is uh, um, it basically what often happens in, in the Tantra is it, it, it uh, uh, creates various sort of uh, uh, symmetries between the mundane, which is between our normal sort of sensory world and um, the transcendent world, or you could say the world of enlightenment, the world of, the, um, of, a high, of higher states of mind, of perfected states of mind. So the Tantra would often um, give sort of uh, mundane day-to-day -day characteristics um, uh, a sort of uh, much more kind of um, uh, uh, transcendent um, correspondence uh, and then match those up with various Buddha figures. So Akashobia uh, does this as well. So say, for example, his, uh, Akashobia has, the time, has a time of the day, which is dawn, and uh, he has a colour, which is deep blue, and he has uh, animals. So he, is, uh, he said to... Um, to rest on two elephants. So he has all these various mundane, what you could describe as mundane characteristics, but actually what the Tantra say corresponds to something much more transcendental, uh, much more sort of, uh, and much higher, much kind of, uh, much, uh, something of much more divine. 
Often this is said, it, 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 sometimes this is said in, in Neoplatonism, people say, as above, so below. So that there are correspondences between sort of um, what our normal sort of sense experience is, um, but there's correspondences with them with something much more sort of significant or meaningful. So to say, uh, yes, yeah, so to say a little bit about um, uh, Akashobia. Now, he, he, just to say a little bit more, actually, he holds the Vajra in his left hand, so I'll say a little bit about the Vajra later. And he has this earth-touching mudra with his right hand. So he touches the earth with his right hand. And um, he, uh, he's said to embody a particular type of wisdom, which is the uh, mirror-like wisdom. So he embodies this particular wisdom called mirror-like wisdom. And um, yeah, well, when I f first came along, I, I first came along uh, uh, to the Dublin Buddhist Centre about uh, 12 years ago. And uh, I meditated for a little while. I wasn't too interested in the Dharma at that point. I was sort of militantly atheist at that point in my life. And uh, so I went off and meditated for a little bit. And... Um, uh, I came back about two years later and I, I, I got more involved, so about 10 years ago now, and immediately Akashobia really appealed to me, really, really appealed to me. And I think he appealed to me for all the wrong reasons. Um, I, I hadn't understood Akashobia at all. Um, I'd sort of got a close but very wrong interpretation uh, of Akashobia. And... Um, he, uh, he, it's particularly this sort of mirror-like wisdom that I think I got very wrong. So what is it we, we were talking about with a, with a mirror-like wisdom? So a mirror-like wisdom, if you have wisdom like a mirror or a mind like a mirror, well, you show exactly what is, don't you? You just, see, you just show the mirror just shows what is. Um, rarely our minds just show what is. We usually distort in pretty significant ways, don't we? So say, for example, um, our minds, if we sort of distort things with craving, often what we do is we bring out, say, if we're, we look towards another human being with cra craving, often what we do is we bring out the aspects of them that are positive, but then sort of subtly kind of put aside the negative bits, don't we? So as if, for example, we fall in love, uh, that person can do no wrong for about three months. Um, <laughs> And then their, their negative bits uh, start to sort of creep back in. We can't edit them out anymore, can we? They sort of start to creep back in. Um, and we feel deeply betrayed, like they've been sort of hiding it, but they haven't. It's just that we've just sort of shelved it. Shelved it. We've kind of edited their negative bits out. Similarly, if we feel very sort of negatively towards somebody, if we're averse to, sort, to somebody, we never see their positive sides, do we? We just sort of, all we see about them is the bad. So a mirror doesn't do this, does it? It sees the, it sees the positive and the negative um, equally uh, and isn't moved particularly by that. Similarly, a, a, a mirror doesn't have assumptions about what it's going to see and then see it, uh, which is what our minds do as well, don't we? We sort of take a view to the world, um, which is a bit like you know, uh, a certain way that we look at things. It's almost like you, know, you could put on a pair of glasses, for example, and it has a view. So a view, an example of a view might be, for example, nobody likes me. That might be a view that we put on every day. And we don't know that we put that view on every day. But we edit our world uh, to conform to that view. So we have assumptions about the world, attitudes about the world. And then our sense experience of the world, our experience of the world conforms to that particular view. So... Um, we say, for example, might, well, we might think that a certain group of people always do this or behave in a certain way. And of course, because we've got that view, uh, our experience will continue to confirm that for us over and over and over again. And it will set aside anything that disconfirms that. So a mirror, again, doesn't do that. A mirror just sees things as it is without views, without assumptions. Um, it doesn't assume what it's going to see and then, and then see it. It sees whatever's there. Um, similarly, uh, it doesn't push some things away and cling to others, does it? Um, so say, for example, if uh, you step into a mirror, the mirror, the mirror doesn't have, you know, it doesn't dislike you, for example, and your, your image vanishes before your very eyes. Uh, neither, say, for example, if you stand there and the mirror finds you particularly attractive or something, does the, the image linger in the mirror after you're gone? It doesn't sort of cling. So the mirror doesn't push away 
what it sees as what might be um, not attractive or ugly and cling to what is uh, attractive or, or what it craves. So the mirror doesn't do that, but we do that, don't we? We sort of push away what we dislike and we cling to very, very strongly uh, what we like. Uh, and we're always in this push and sort of pull uh, with our experience, always looking to get more of what we like and push away what we dislike. Uh, so we're always doing that, but the mirror doesn't do that. So, um, so, so Akashobia uh, represents this mirror-like wisdom uh, in this particular way. And well, you might have started to get a sense of what that might be, say, for example, in your meditation uh, over the last little while. We haven't been here for long, but in your meditation in the last 24 hours, because in a sense, meditation is a mirror, isn't it? It holds a mirror up to our minds. Um, meditation will show us what's there. Uh, it, it won't, if we're, you know, sort of in any way kind of doing it right, which I'm sure we all are, um, the mirror won't conform to our particular view of ourselves. The meditation won't, if, if we do it long enough and commit to it, we might have an idea of ourselves as being, say, for example, very wonderful people, very lovely people, uh, which will be partly true, but we also might have a sense of ourselves as not able to, uh, to do any harm, uh, as to not have any hatred, as to not have any anger, as to not have any ill will, basically to be sort of lovely people. And of course, meditation, if we stick with it long enough and commit to it, holds a mirror up to our minds in that way and says, actually, well, do you know what? There is anger, there is hatred, there is craving, uh, there is all those things that we might find unfashionable and we might not want to see in ourselves. So, so you know, however long I've been meditating now, 13 years or so, I still find things that I just think, oh no, I'm that way, aren't I? I was like, that's the, I, that, you know, things I completely disidentify with. And I'm like, I turn to, oh God, I'm like that. Oh, I'm sensitive. Oh no, I think the worst thing could be in the world. <laughs> sensitive. I'm thin skinned. I can't believe it. So, so when I, so, so yes, yeah, so this mirror like wisdom, I think it's a bit, you can think of meditation as a mirror actually, and you can think of actually meditation starting to develop this mirror like wisdom. And what we're really looking to do in meditation is just sit with what is there. Uh, to shit, uh, to sit, excuse me, to sit. <laughs> oh, it's Freudian. Uh, to sit with what is there um, without, without being sort of, um, yeah, without, I've completely lost the train of thought. <laughs> to sit, just to sit with what's there. So we can start to relate uh, to. Um, this mirror-like wisdom in our meditation. We're looking to cultivate this mirror-like wisdom, particularly in our meditation, particularly with our experience. So we're not looking to uh, put some sort of pixie dust all over it where we pretend it's something that it's not. We're not trying to be nice Buddhists with it. We're not trying to sort of uh, market our image to ourselves and to other people anymore. It's just what's there. Sometimes it can be uh, a bit salutary. That's what we're doing with meditation. So I first uh, found Buddhism um, when I was uh, 26. I first found the Dharma when I was about uh, 26. And um, I really was not in a good way when I found it. R really was not in a good way. I was uh, particularly lonely. I was very, very isolated. I was completely lost, I would say. I had very little of sort of meaning or direction uh, in my life. I was very angry with the world. Uh, uh, very angry with the world and I, I took all this sort of negativity and uh, what I had done very well up to that point from the point of being a young child where I probably actually started experiencing a lot of these things uh, from a very early age my, my mum says that I was angry coming out of the womb um, <laughs> I mean you could understand couldn't you it's warm you know you're fed all the rest of it uh, Badger Sure, my KM said, if that's not a, um, a good argument for rebirth, I don't know what is. But my mum said I was angry coming out of the womb. And I think from as a child into growing into my teenage years, what I learned was strategies to repress that uncomfortable, unpleasant, um, negative emotion in me. I, I didn't want to feel it. 
Uh, so I, it was too painful to feel it at times. I just couldn't have done it. Um, so my strategy was just to just cut off from it, to really sort of um, put all emotion and feeling at arm's length. Um, and I became very, very heady, very, very cut off from my emotional world, very cut off from my feelings. I, I felt things very, very strongly, actually. I still do. And um, I think it was just too much, you know, to feel the level of sort of, uh, you know, anger and, and lostness and all of those things as a, as a teenage boy it was too much. I felt so strongly and I, I think I just repressed it. You know, that was my way of going about it. So I became very, very heady very, very disconnected from my emotional world and very, very heady. Um, you know, I was basically, I was kind of like a life support system, a brain on a life support system. It wasn't, you know, it was, I was just all ideas, basically. The, very little heart, very little emotion and very little feeling. And um, I saw Akashobia and uh, I walked into the Dublin Buddhist Centre and they, they told me about his mirror-like wisdom. And I said, that sounds fantastic. Uh, that sounds absolutely brilliant. Um, because I thought Akashobia's mirror-like wisdom sounded exactly like the sort of unfeeling objectivity that I really wanted in my life. I thought, that sounds great. You're just completely objective. You don't let any sort of messy feelings get in the way or messy emotions in the way. You just see things exactly as they are. Like, uh, you're, <clears throat> you're just completely like sort of, I don't know, like some sort of statistician like that or something like that, or like a scientist kind of... I don't know, or some jaded medical consultant, you know, handing out terminal diagnosis or something like that. You know. I'm sorry, it's terminal, you know, so nothing you can do about it, you know. So, you know, like enlightenment is um, full frontal lobotomy or something like that. That's how, that's how I mistakenly saw Akashobia's mirror-like wisdom. Um, I thought, oh yeah, fantastic. Well, that type of enlightenment really appeals to me. Uh, because I can just be completely objective. I can keep everybody at arm's length. Nobody will hurt me. I'll see things exactly as they are, with no sort of mess. Um, I'll keep life at arm's length, uh, and it will be great. That will be really great. I'll just see everything completely sort of factually. Um, so... So it, it was, you know, it, and, and actually, in a sense, you know, I wasn't the first person to make that mistake. When academics first sort of discovered Buddhism in the West and it first started coming over, that was often how it was talked about. Um, Buddhism was sort of seen as this, um, as this very sort of passionless, kind of detached, unfeeling, unemotional um, sort of attempt to kind of numb yourself where everything would just be numb. This was the, the misunderstanding of Buddhism that came out at the time. This was academics um, who hadn't practiced Buddhism, uh, by the way. They were just sort of uh, trying to discover it and trying to learn about it. This is how it was often written about. And you can kind of understand, actually, because in some ways it, it can maybe make that mistaken impression. So, for example, we talk about in Buddhism overcoming the passions. Um, or we talk about the void, uh, or we talk about emptiness, or we talk about non-attachment. So you can see how all of these sort of qualities of enlightenment, which were very, very rough uh, translations from the Pali and the Sanskrit, could, with, uh, 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 without a strong understanding uh, of the Buddhist tradition and the Buddhist path, be mistaken for... Um, just looking to make your world as 2D as possible, um, as sort of um, as numb and flat as possible, so that nothing ever perturbed you, nothing ever sort of uh, perturbed you, not because uh, you were sort of unshakably loving or unshakably wise, but because you were actually just disconnected from it. You were just heady, you had no emotion left. So it, it, it's not actually completely impossible to see. Um, how, um, uh, how that would be understood as that. I think probably culturally today, actually, we, we lean more towards that mistake still. Um, it's been very good watching Yanavach and Maitre Bandu have these conversations and interviews with Ian McGilchrist. And um, Ian McGilchrist, a very uh, intelligent, almost a genius, in fact, he's a, a professor in... Um, in neuroscience and uh, uh, English 
in Oxford. And um, he's got this whole theory how the left hemisphere of the brain, it's not a very Buddhist way of talking, but let's, let's think of it sort of um, poetically. The left hemisphere of the brain um, is, um, uh, has become really, really dominant uh, within our culture and has sort of established and communicated itself through the culture, sort of seeped through the culture. And the left hemisphere of the brain particularly is oriented towards um, abstract uh, uh, reasoning, uh, to abstraction generally, to objectivity, uh, to um, uh, sort of distance, uh, to logic, to reason, uh, to all of those things, all of which are perfectly fine, and, and uh, Ian McGilchrist said are perfectly fine, but have become completely sort of unbalanced by this more right brain or right hemisphere uh, qualities of intuition, uh, of metaphor, of feeling, uh, of emotion, uh, of um, yeah, uh, uh, implicitness as, exposed, as opposed to explicitness, uh, all of those things. So he, he really thinks that actually this way of looking at the world, which is a very objective and um, sort of uh, uh, cool way looking at the world, deta detached way of looking at the world, uh, has become dominant in our culture and dominant in our thinking. Uh, and so again, you can understand how um, somebody coming to Buddhism would see that in it because it's probably what's privileged and emphasised uh, a lot in our culture. But actually, what Ian McGilchrist would say and what the Buddhist tradition would say is that you leave so much of yourself behind uh, when you don't cultivate those qualities of, uh, of your emotions, of your, of your reverence, of your devotion, um, of, your, um, uh, of your intuition, uh, of poetry of art, of beauty, of magic, of all of those things, that actually you leave half of yourself behind uh, when you don't cultivate those things. That's what the, Buddha, um, the Buddhist tradition would have said for a long time. And it's interesting now, you know, Professor McGilfer saying uh, uh, similarly. So, so how can we think of mirror-like wisdom? Um, if it's not this sort of detached 2D, unfeeling, um, uh, wisdom, how can we think about it? Well, one of the ways I think we, that we can think about it is, um, is uh, uh, love without attachment. We can think of it as love without attachment. So Buddhism always starts from a place of love. Uh, it always starts from a place of love. The Mahayana from which these figures arose out of uh, uh, really prioritized uh, love as the sort of primary virtue in a certain sense. Um, that it was, um, yeah, it, it's both, you know, the sort of the beginning and the end uh, in, a certain, in a certain sense, so the primary virtue. So what this, what this mirror-like wisdom, I think, is, is love unified uh, with wisdom. And so what does that mean? Because, you know, I think often we have experience, say, for example, of... Uh, love with uh, attachment, which is usually our romantic love, don't we? Um, or indifference with non-attachment. So often the way that we experience love is with an awful lot of attachment, with an awful lot of clinging to what we love. Or if we don't have attachment, it's usually because we're indifferent. Uh, it's usually because we're sort of um, um, not bothered, shall we say, disconnected. So Mirror-like wisdom is a wisdom that has, is completely unified with love, uh, but is not clinging. It's not attached, which is a very, very kind of, I think it's a very, very difficult thing for us to imagine. Um, I think for most of us initially, actually, I, I'm certainly think to say this talking for myself, what we need to cultivate before we ever think about cultivating uh, or cultivating non-attachment or, or dropping attachment is just cultivating love, uh, is just looking to cultivate, uh, in a sense, a healthy attachment, um, a healthy attachment, for example, to our friends, uh, to our family, um, uh, you know, to people around us, and then we can start to worry about going beyond uh, attachment. In a sense, actually, you can only go beyond attachment from a place of a healthy human attachment. Um, the only way that you can actually really drop attachment 
in, in the Buddhist sense, from a wisdom sense, in a mirror-like wisdom sense, is to have really cultivated a, a full, human, loving, alive connection and attachment to people. And I think most of us need to work on this much, much more before we can actually start worrying significantly um, about uh, losing attachment. If we, if we drop attachment uh, without that ba uh, uh, basis of love, um, all that we've done is we've become coldly detached. Uh, we've not achieved enlightenment. We've not achieved this mirror-like uh, wisdom at all. It was certainly the case for me, I think, uh, that first of all, what I really, really needed to do um, was just, it was just cultivate much, much more attachment, particularly with my friends. I really needed to, to uh, cultivate an attachment with our friends. I think at the moment we are in a slight bit of crisis um, of friendship, actually. I think this is particularly true uh, of young men, actually. I think young men particularly are just not forming those strong friendships that they really should and a, and a strong attachment as they really should. And that was certainly the case uh, for me. So at the LBC, we really, really emphasise uh, friendship. It's something that we really uh, encourage people to put a lot of time into, is their friendships. And I really... Uh, was hugely, really benefited from that teaching. If I had gone to another school, I might not have got that. In fact, I probably wouldn't have got that teaching. It's not a particularly common teaching um, in the Buddhist tradition. Had I gone somewhere else, I probably wouldn't. It wouldn't have been emphasised so much to me that I needed to make friends. Um, but I really did. I was really lost and I really needed to make friends. So we really emphasise uh, friendship. And of course, we, we, always re we really emphasise metta as well. So tomorrow, for example, we'll be uh, learning the, the Metta Bhavana. And that you could think of the Metta Bhavana as cultivation of friendship or cultivation of love. And um, uh, at the LBC, we, we really focus on both of those things because if we're going to develop a mirror-like wisdom, actually what we just need to do is start from a, a really, really strong place of love. Mostly we do think of sort of love in the romantic sense, don't we? And of course... There's very, very, there's lots of attachment with that. It's very, it's very hard to sort of fall in love with somebody romantically and just be completely well-wishing towards them. I mean, that'd be almost impossible, wouldn't it? Like, say, you could imagine, say, for example, you fall madly in love and your beloved comes to you one day and says, uh, darling, I've found somebody, they're absolutely perfect for me. Uh, I'm so happy I'm leaving you. Um, one's response is not likely to be, well, that is fantastic. <laughs> I am so happy for you. Uh, all my well-wishing to you and best of luck in future life. Uh, it's not likely to be the response. So there's love there, but there's an awful, an awful lot of clinging around us as well. Not that there's anything wrong with romance. It's fantastic, um, uh, I think. I, I can remember. Um, so... Um, <laughs> So our well-wishing is often conditional, isn't it? It's conditional on you do this for me and I'll, I'll, uh, I'll wish you well. Uh, but the Buddha's enlightened vision or the, the mirror-like wisdom, um, love without attachment is just absolutely unconditionally loving. Uh, it, it does not matter um, what happens. Uh, Akashobia's name means unshakable. And you could think of that actually as an unshakable love, uh, uh, an imperturbable love. Uh, a love that is, is, is just not affected by the externalities of the particular thing that uh, one loves, uh, that, that it's completely unconditional, an incredibly high ideal uh, uh, to look to and one that is, well, in the Buddhist tradition, actually, it's lifetimes of work, but it's certainly enough for, for one lifetime and, and probably many more. So, so what we can do, actually, is... One of the ways that we can start to train in this love without attachment is, is, is through friendship. Friendship is probably the place that you will most likely start to experience very, very strong sense of love, very, very strong sense of affection, but without that sort of clingy attachment that often comes with romance, for example, uh, with uh, without the conditional well-wishing and more towards the just, um, the just straightforward well-wishing. Of course, it doesn't always happen in friendship like that, but that will probably be the place where we can start to uh, uh, train in it more and more. I had a very, when I, I think of this, I had a very, um, my good friend Diane Atha, he's, um, he's at Pamelok actually, I think, over this uh, couple of weeks, but we, we shared a room 
uh, for three years. That always sounds romantic, but it, it wasn't. It was platonic. And uh, we shared a room for three years just above the, um, uh, the LBC in the Samuel Gavasa community. And um, we became very, very close. Uh, I can say I love Dianatha very much. Um, we became very, very close in the, in the three years that we shared. He's the other uh, men's Mitchell convener at the LBC, and we, we really sort of just almost became one. I mean, it's funny, you do actually start finishing each other's sentences. Mm -hmm. We started to think we should get his and hers towels or something like that. <laughs> but our minds did, just did just start to sort of mould together. Um, and um, yeah, we, 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 I think we built a very, very strong affection for each other. And I remember when he had, uh, he was discussing to go down to Sacavity, which is the community downstairs. And um, he was sort of discussing it with me and he sort of hummed and hawed and went to and from about it. And, um, and uh, uh, because he's a very uh, upstanding and, um, uh, yeah, because he's a very upstanding man, he decided to go down. Uh, they needed him in Sukavati and uh, that he decided to go down to help there, particularly in the community. And... Um, so he decided he would go down. I said, okay, that's, that's no problem, Dianath. And we, it was sort of fine. As it, as it came to the sort of time that he was due to go down, I started to get upset. But I didn't know what I was upset about. Uh, this is a very common thing with me, I'm afraid. I'm still learning my emotional world. And sometimes I get upset, but have absolutely no idea what I'm upset about. And... Um, what I usually need to do when I get in that state is talk to some of my friends and uh, try and establish what it is that I'm upset about. They sort of, sort of go down through a list. Mm, is it that? Is it that? I think, oh, no. So I was sat in um, uh, with uh, Dianatha one day, and uh, he was going, oh, well, what is it this? You know, you're a little, it was a little, there was that, that sharp text from your brother a few weeks ago. I was saying, no, I don't, I don't think it is. No, I said, well, oh, you got You've, got, you've um, got that retreat coming up, don't you? You certainly mightn't be looking forward to that too much. Um, no, I don't think it's that. I don't think it's that. And he said, well, well it might be because I'm going. <laughs> and I, said, I think it was about to say, get over yourself. <laughs> but as soon as he said it, I knew that was it. I knew that's what it was. I just, it was like somebody had just given me this big sort of kick in the chest and there was no doubt whatsoever um, that I was upset because Dianath was leaving. This three years that we had sort of sharing a room together um, was coming to an end. Uh, Dianath uh, uh, was going downstairs to help to Calvary and I was really uh, upset about it and I actually burst into tears. I completely sort of wept not in a sort of dignified way, in a quite, <laughs> in quite it was quite in a quite a pathetic way, actually. I saw so I wept and wept and wept and wept, and mm. <laughs> but I could still wish him well, and I still knew it was the right thing. Uh, I was still incredibly impressed by his heroism in, in picking up. He'd been in, in Samagavasa seven years at that point, and he was picking up to go down to Sakavati and help there. I was very, very impressed by it. And I think, actually, it was the appropriate Buddhist response. Maybe not so sort of so over the top, you know, in, the, in my weeping, but I think it was the appropriate Buddhist response. And you do have that, actually, in the tradition. You have other examples of that happening. So say, for example, um, Milarepa, who is a, another figure from Tibetan Buddhism, he had this uh, very, very dear disciple of his called Rachungpa. And Rachungpa caused him all sorts of problems when he first came along. And Milarepa was always sort of singing uh, his complaint of him, actually. He was sort of like, oh, Rachungpa, you, you annoy me in this way and this way, and, and you break my heart in this way, because he was a difficult disciple to have. And... Um, but uh, Rachungpa became enlightened eventually uh, through, through Milarepa's help. Milarepa was a, a yogi that used to live above the uh, mountain, the snow peak in the Tibetan hills, and very, very famous in Tibetan Buddhism as a, as a, as a meditator. Uh, so he lived amongst the caves, uh, wearing nothing but a sort of loincloth and eating nothing but nettles. He's, he's, he's dark green because he ate nothing but nettles, according to the tradition. And... Um, there's one day they're finally due to part 
they're finally due to go their separate ways forever. And uh, Milarepa knows that he won't see Rachungpa ever again, and he, he weeps, he bursts into tears. Uh, this enlightened being feels so strongly because he had such a good and heartfelt disciple in Rachungpa. And Rachungpa is now living, and, and Milarepa just weeps and weeps and weeps. So I think it's the appropriate response um, from a Buddhist perspective. So we can feel strongly, I think, what the mirror-like wisdom uh, sells to us and what Akashobia is communicating to us is we can feel strongly. In fact, we have to feel strongly. If we're not feeling strongly, it's not Buddhist. Uh, we can feel strongly without clinging. Um, we can have complete and total well-wishing uh, without clinging. So the way that we do that is we practice the Dharma. Yeah? So we, we, we cultivate love, we cultivate our friendships, we cultivate our, our normal, healthy human attachments um, and uh, 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 do all of those things. And then we, 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 we practice the Dharma. And with practicing the Dharma, um, with studying the scriptures, with coming on retreat, with meditating, with developing friends within the Sangha, the Buddhist community, um, we very, very naturally start to let go of clinging. We sort of ease off on clinging bit by bit by bit. And especially, say, for example, if your friends um, are also practicing the Dharma, um, that will really help because, um, you know, ideally, from their perspective, they're not going to want to be clung to uh, and they're going to, um, they're going to uh, push back on that. So if you, if you practice the Dharma, study the Dharma, cultivate friendships within the Dharma, where you can train in this love without attachment, um, you can start to just very, very naturally, organically and spontaneously uh, uh, let go of the gripping that we all do. Um, uh, and you'll get uh, this unification of love and wisdom, actually, which I think is symbolized uh, most strongly by the Vajra. So you'll see this Vajra here, Akashobi has got it uh, held in the palm of his left hand. And the Vajra is said to symbolize the unification of, of total love uh, with total wisdom. Uh, so you could think of wisdom particularly in this sense as non-clinging, so non-attachment. Um, and uh, the Vajra symbolizes uh, this unification of love uh, with wisdom, with, with non-clinging. And uh, it's said to be an incredibly powerful uh, symbol. Uh, the Vajra, which you might actually see, there's more of them here along the shrine. Uh, as you go up, you'll see them uh, sort of dotted around the shrine. Uh, there's lots of them, in fact. And uh, the Vajra is, is said to be the most powerful symbol you can imagine, um, this sort of complete unification uh, of love and wisdom. So I'll, I'll leave you just with one final little story um, about, um, well, my experience of that actually just in terms of what happens when love starts to let go of clinging because actually what happens is not, is not less love but more. So I, um, I've got two younger brothers and um, uh, 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 both of them uh, I, I'm very, very close with. We grew up together quite close in age actually one uh, two years younger than me and the other two years younger than him so four years between us in total and um, it was a slightly chaotic household my, my parents got separated when both my parents were very loving and, and um, very good I, I owe a huge amount to both of them um, but it could sometimes be a bit of a chaotic household and, and my parents separated when I was eight and one of the things that often happens uh, among siblings in, in um, separated households is they turn very, very much in towards each other. Um, they start to rely on each other very, very strongly. There's a sort of sense of camaraderie that gets built amongst, amongst siblings in a, in a household where you know, there might be a bit more, it's not as stable, saying. So this really developed uh, between me and my two younger brothers. And I'd say we were actually, for, for many, many years, I mean, we still are, I, I, I think of my brothers as amongst my best friends. And um, so very, very strong. Um, and uh, my, my middle brother, Pete, he, um, he had a long-distance relationship with uh, uh, an American woman, Megan. And um, uh, uh, they got married recently, actually, about, well, a few years ago. And uh, there was one night when I was over in Dublin and myself and Pete were out 
And uh, we were sort of talking about, well, what might happen, what the future might hold. And, um, well, he was saying, oh, you know, uh, myself and Megan, we might, we might stay in Dublin, but, you know, we might go back to the States. And uh, I immediately felt this sort of, oh, no. You know, I felt all the sort of clinging of my attachment. I really did not want to lose my brother to the Atlantic Ocean. Um, you know, with all of the things that come with that in terms of seeing each other maybe, maybe once a year, maybe once every three, four years talking very, very occasionally. You know, I loved my brother, I do love my brother so much and didn't want him to go uh, over to America. And he said, well, you know, we might, we might do that. And I sort of argued with him for a bit. You know, I said, oh, are you sure you want to do that? You know, it's a long way away. And when you have support and all those things, so I'm giving all the reasons why they shouldn't, he shouldn't, Pete shouldn't go to America with Megan. And um, later that night, Pete just sort of batted him back. He was like, oh, whatever, Kev, you know, no, sorry. Uh, uh, he's like, uh, 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 he, just, he just didn't accept them, basically. So we're sort of, I'm lying in bed that night going over more and more reasons as to why my brother shouldn't move to America. And I'm thinking, oh, well, the, the healthcare is very expensive. <laughs> we thought about the healthcare. There's lots of guns. It's quite dangerous. You know, they shouldn't do that. And I thought to myself, I was, I was ordained at this point, so it really did behoove me to think more dharmically, more in a Buddhist way about these particular issues. And I said to myself, Amelie Odin, come on. You know that you must be separated from everything and everybody that you love eventually, that you cannot cling to them. You cannot hold to that. Uh, why are you doing it with your brother? <clears throat> Uh, that also must end at some point. And with that, just as I let go in that way, this well-wishing, this current river of well-wishing and love just sort of flowed through me. And um, I just thought, you no, know, whatever they do, all I'm going to do is wish them well in it. Um, all I'm going to do is support them. All I'm going to do is give my affection. And uh, it... it it showed to me, actually, that our clinging doesn't, doesn't help us to express love or feel love anymore. In fact, it, it cuts the legs from under it. It, uh, it stops us from feeling love and affection and well-wishing um, uh, where, uh, where we really should. So that is, is Akashobia. That is the figure of, um, uh, of wisdom, uh, of uh, mirror-like wisdom, uh, of love uh, without attachment. So uh, I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much.